Hey all, Board Game Rancher, where you'll find everything solo, tabletop, gaming, and more. And here are my thoughts on Lisboa, how it plays solo. Let's take a look. I'll see you on the other side. So here we are in the not so lovely city of Lisboa. It's gone. It got destroyed. Earthquakes, tsunamis, fires, gone. And we have some rubble here. Here's the, the ruins of it represented by these, these cubes. The red ones are, are the, that represent fire. These tan ones represent the earthquake. The blue ones represent the tsunami damage. And everything's been devastated. Now, we have the nobles over here that we have to work with in order to rebuild Lisboa, very generally. And the way you're going to do that is by, you'll have a, a player board, you're going to have a hand of cards, and again, very generally, you're going to take a card and you're going to play it either on your board by slipping it in up here, tucking it in down there, or you'll play it to this board, the main board, right there. And then you will activate whatever actions that card allows you to activate. So you've got the nobles here, and there's three of them. And this is the builder. If you activate the builder, you're going to be able to build shops out there. That's going to help you produce resources, get things going that way. Or you can visit the minister. The minister has access to decrees, and the decrees are sort of like uh, end game scoring goals there's a bajillion of them but very generally that that's what he does he gives you access to end game scoring goals the king will open public buildings so you would be placing if you use the builder you would be placing something out like so and from your board here you would be grabbing one of your shops like so and depending on how you place it i'm placing it on this street which represents the the bookstores that means that would produce books looks like that and there's four different types there's books cloth gold and tools but where the builder helps you build these shops that help you produce and all that stuff the king allows you to open public uh, buildings that are going to basically thematically draw traffic to your store. And so those would be, if these were in the right spots right here, you have your option of these either from the green or the blue, and you would be placing these and you want to make sure you got the appropriate colors so they're driving the correct traffic to, and both of these would drive book traffic. So if this was placed right there, then you're going to score points. Depending on, you know, if you, you build the shop and that's there, you're going to score points. If the shop's already there and then you build that, you're going to score points. So and you score the points down below. These are little random point doohickeys that you, you put out. I would get five points. And uh, this would score all stores that are representative of its resource there. So, so that's how you are going to be building things and producing things and, and generating points which are called wigs in this game your victory points are your wigs he, he or she who has the most wigs will win the game at the end so on the outside you can see again all these spots for public buildings and in in the middle here you can see all these spots to build to potentially build your shops there's some random ones that are blocked i am actually well i'll get to that but i'm playing a different variation of this solo and but uh, to do all these things, basically to use the nobles, you're going to have to influence them. So you've got this influence track that's going to go up and down. You've got officials that are going to be, you know, in each you know, trying to schmooze with the the nobles there that has something to do with the game. Um, so you're going to have to be monitoring that because when you put out public buildings you're going to have to remove officials to man those buildings and then you're going to have to get more officials back and so they're going to be working that little little ditty all of these nobles too have state actions two of them 
that you'll have access to should you use uh, them. And so uh, these actions allow you to build boats or produce, or there's this clergy track as well. So the church is another little mechanic here, a fun thing you get to deal with as, as this guy kind of marches around and around and around. You're going to be able to take these towels, which give you all sorts of cool bonuses and stuff. And that's going to move this little treasury marker, you know, up potentially. You're going to play other cards that'll move the, the marker down. That's going to affect, uh, very generally, the influence and the money. There's also money in this game, yet you'll be spending mostly to build shops and you'll be using influence mostly to work with the nobles there so that's the nuts and bolts of the games and here's a little market thing too this is going to dictate prices prices start at a certain point in the game but once goods start getting produced prices are going to get driven down and so the way you'll be selling those goods is by getting ships tucking them in and placing your, your goods, selling your goods, and then you're going to get you know, market price plus, plus possibly some modifiers. That's how you'll be selling your goods is sending them away on chips. And your player board here is going to also demonstrate that you've got this cool little mechanism here where you're going to want to collect sets of rubble. As I was talking about earlier, there's fire, tsunami, and earthquake rubble. And here you can see, if you look really close, this is, you got to put you know, tsunami stuff there, fire stuff there, earthquake stuff there. Once you get a nice little rubble set, you take this off and it's going to give you a plus one. That means that that dictates right now I can have up to two resources. Well, you start with one and you can have up to two cards in your tableau. And there you can put three cards up there and three cards down here. But right now, I could only put two. But once you get your rubble sets going, you're going to increase that number, like so. Also, you're going to score points for this. Also, this game is played in, in sort of two phases, uh, a, a, a general one phase and, and then a second phase, and then the game is over. And I, again, am using an unofficial variant, solo variant, that maybe I'll go more into detail as we start talking about what I'm thinking about this game. So this is classic Vidal Lacerda yumminess. I played a number of his games, all solo. I don't think I've played a single, no, I have played the Gallerist once multiplayer. But I played the Gallerist, I played Kanban, I played on Mars, Vinos. This is, I mean, this is his style of game. It's a, a thematically, he's one of the very few that pulls off an actual theme where you feel the theme playing a heavy Euro. He does it very well. And here you've got Lisboa, it is, it's broken, it's destroyed based on history. And there's plenty of good little tidbits that you can read as you're reading through the rule book that I, I'm assuming is all historically factual. And it just brings you into the game that much more and when you also too read up on how the mechanics are like when you're trying to create these rubble sets when you're trying to get you know the blue and the red and the tan cube it means something it has something to do with you know how things were when things were being rebuilt there was rubble removed that was very valuable and reused and and so it makes sense that that would by collecting those sets it enhances your play just stuff like that Vito Lacerda does it really like no one else does, and his designs are are so easy to implement once you get it. And I think it's a bit of a disservice when I keep seeing his games weighted so heavy on BGG. Like this one's like a 4.5 something. And I've said before, I just don't agree with the weight on it. And not, not because I feel like I'm some genius and I'm just that good at games. You know, it's not that heavy. No, I think the, the reason why those ratings occur is because the, the, the cost of entry into a Vita Lacerda game is high. You've got to invest. I mean, it, there's just a lot of moving parts and it's tough to wrap your head around. But once you do, and it just takes a couple games, 
then the game, it just, it does, it sings, it just plays so beautifully and, and it loses that, that initial heavy factor. You know, I, I liken it to trying to, you know, you're trying to get a shuttle out of, out into Earth's orbit it takes tremendous energy. But once you're out in orbit, you can just glide around beautifully, almost effortlessly. And that's the way a Vito Lacerda game really plays to me. When you get on the other side of that huge rule book and, and just all that is what it is, you're into a nice 3.9 plus weight game. And if, at a glance, if someone looks at BGG and sees those 4.5s and stuff, I think it turns a lot of people off to a game that they would otherwise really, really enjoy. So, well, I think that that's a little too bad. I see that with On Mars and back to this game, though, it, it has, it reminds me a little bit of the Gallerist, Lisboa. The solo version reminds me of the Gallerist. You know, there's there's this, uh, some mechanics there that, that share some similarities. Also, too, just the the way the solo design is. Vito Lacerda has a way of designing heavy thematic Euro games, also has a way of designing his solo variants. And they're all very, they, they feel similar. They're very, typically very easy to run. And this is no different. And, but they're also too, just pretty easy to figure out. And, and it doesn't really feel like you're playing a real player. It just feels like a great way to learn the game uh, get used to its mechanics, so then maybe eventually you go on and you teach multi, you know, a multiplayer game. But that's not what I'm in it for. You know, I play games predominantly solo. You know, I don't know, 90% of the time, but almost all the time. <laughs> so, considering that, I think that there's enough here as a solo variant to make many players happy, especially if you mainly play multiplayer, but you just want to get your fix of Lisboa. This is a great way to do it. The way it's designed, it gives you a nice little goal at the end to, to try and you know, not only beat with, with points, with wigs, but also to achieve certain levels of victory. And that runs through, that 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 style runs through most of his, his games. The Gallerist, I've seen it on, on Mars. And but it's just not enough. You know, I, I, I like a more involved AI. And so what you saw there um, was something I found. Game Rules for One is, I believe, the BGG user. And he's been doing unofficial solo variants, fan-made solo variants for games for years, well over a decade, and has done some fantastic ones. And they are toned to the solo gamer like me. And the variant that he's done is fantastic. I've played it only a couple times, but it's immediately, it's, I know that I, I will not go back to the official solo variant once you get this. And that's how good they are. And so there's at least that option. So while the solo variant for Lisboa is, I would say, just on par with with the other variants I've seen Vito Lacerda put out for, with his games, it's still typically just not enough for me. It always leaves me for wanton, and this was no different. It, uh, and then fortunately there was this other option. So there, there's that. But as far as the game goes, and just speaking just as far, you know, did I like the game? Well, thematically, I think it's it's fantastic. Just how he incorporated the theme into this game, which just brings you more into it. He really does that better than anyone else, I think, or at least as well as anyone else who designs Euro games. From a value perspective, I've always had kind of an issue with Eagle Griffin and just just how expensive their games are. There's there, I just wish they would tone it down a little and put out a production that was. But I guess then there wouldn't be Eagle Griffin games. But just when I compare it to other productions, like uh, like what Chip Theory Games puts out regularly and cost wise, and I balance those. And Chip Theory Games is just is is just superior. Where, where you know the reason why they develop their games makes sense. Whereas here it just seems like it's just done because you know it's like well that's what we do. We make inch thick chits. Just, you know, tone that down, make them a little thinner, you know, I don't know, but that's a personal preference. I just wish I could pick up this game for 60 or 70 bucks instead of a hundred plus dollars. All of Vito Lacerda games or, you know, Eagle Griffin games in general. You know, even if you look at uh, production like Mechs vs. Minions, it's another one that's just 
I mean, it's over the top, cartoonish, lifelike, amazing. And, and here with Equal Griffin Games and with this, I, I just feel again, like it's overpriced. Now I got this on a good ding and dent special. Um, I will continue to buy Vita Lacerda games because they're just that good. But I do find for my money, the value is, I, I just, I think it's, uh, I wish I saw that price point go down and I would be willing to sacrifice a little bit on the extra thickness of the chits and some of the extra little goodies that just, just aren't really, don't bring anything to the game for me. Moving on, mechanics wise, this is, it's, it's flawless. The design to me is just something magical, just how all the different things are intertwined and you've got your, uh, you've got your building your city and how you, and that's your focus and it's cool just all the cross referencing you got to do and cuz you got you spending money to create your shops you got to you got to have your officials to basically pay for your your public buildings around those shops that are going to bring in traffic they're going to score you points and then and then you've got you know your houses as you remove houses off of your board it unlocks little abilities there as you're collecting rubble sets by building when you build a store, you get a piece of rubble. When you put out a, a, an official building, you get rubble. You start collecting your sets. There's that to think about. When you cover up those spaces, there's there's stuff. Whatever you cover up, you get. So there's a lot of fun, delicious decisions to be made in that main part of the game. But all of that happens only by playing your card to your board, playing your card to the main board. And depending on what officials you're using, you can also follow... Um, each other so like if it's your opponent's turn or the ai's turn then if you have a favor then you can call in that favor after they're done with their turn to use that same action that same official that they use and so or not official same noble so there's so much that that goes into this this game that all interacts so flawlessly i just i love it mechanics are just beetle beetle is there to magic the variability because of you there's so many different ways to go there there just seems like an endless game you can just you can start stacking up resources and shipping and shipping and shipping getting points that way you can really focus on stores and getting the majority of stores on those roads because you're going to score the end game has a lot to do with what stores you produce how many who's got how many and what road and oh there's all sorts of different points to go for and to focus on that you can you can go a different direction every game and it can it can happen it has to do with the cards that you're dealt with but then you're able to kind of pick pick the cards as you're playing the game so lots of variability there the length of play you're looking at about an hour to hour and a half once you get this down and so that that i mean for as heavy as this game again that that's you know a heavy heavy game to me is just takes longer because you're thinking so much here once you get the mechanics down uh, the rules down you can you can go go through this really delicious game in about an hour to an hour and a half the uh, rule book i think is remarkable i think it's beautifully done and and it's very easy to follow and once you get through that rule book and, and then it has a little tiny little 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 page insert there to uh not tiny it's just uh front and back is it front and back it might yeah it is front and back so for the solo variant the official solo variant but if you're looking to get into game rules for one the solo play that you got an eight page document to go through and read and and it comes with its own little stack of <laughs> of cards that allow you to kind of quick reference but even just a couple plays in playing the unofficial variant as daunting as it seems it just it brings the game to life because you really feel like you're playing an opponent as opposed to the very deterministic official variant you're playing a, a, an opponent that adjusts to the game. It's not just going to take the same actions over and over and over again in a certain way. You never really know. Uh, it is beautifully done. And in fact, it's done in such a way that the the decrees, which are kind of all over the place when you're playing the official solo variant, just kind of at the mercy of, ah, it was just, that was, that would be, that was a tough thing to try to implement into a solo variant when you have all these tremendous variations of end game scoring opportunities. Well, solo play did away sort of with the decrees use uses the decrees to generate the ai's actions it's incredible it, it's just it's amazing how how it's genius anyway so so the the solo parameters of the official variant are very straightforward the the ai just takes the same actions again and goes around and around and around and very predictable 
you can see what's going to happen. The solo parameters for the unofficial variant are not like that. They're right up a solo tabletop gamer's alley, at least one that predominantly plays solo like me, and enjoys reading and, and getting into it. I just don't mind learning the extra rules to bring that game to life the way I, I feel like it, it deserves. Scoring, as far as the official variant is concerned, you, well, you just score a, a you kind of just score regularly for the most part, but uh, after you have either won or lost, then there's little, you know, you look at how many stores you've done, how many, I, I forget, there's just, there's like, there's four different um, levels of victory, if you will. And so, whereas if you are playing the unofficial solo variant, there is, I mean, for, first you have to get more points, but then there's a lot of different levels of victory there. And so, so they both have their levels of victory, but but how the variants are implemented while you're playing is night and day. Overall enjoyability, this game is, it's just, it's, exact, it's exactly what I expected from Beetle Lacerda. It's why I keep buying his games over and over again. It's why I have Escape Plan coming. And uh, I, I know it's just a matter of time before I pick up CO2 and, and other stuff. Uh, Kanban, see, this is where I believe that, that Beetle Lacerda is really getting it right. He's commissioned. David Turchi to create a solo variant for Kanban. And I am looking forward to that. And but solo play, game rules for one, was the David Turchi of solo gaming before David Turchi was David Turchi. That's it. I think it's all I have to say about Lisboa. If you are a fan of Beetle Lacerda, like I am, of those mechanics of that thematic heavy Euro. I don't really see how you can go wrong picking up this game. Just know that the solo variant is right on par with all of his other solo variants. And if you don't mind those, then you're not gonna mind this one either. Till next time, I'm Board Game Man. Thanks for watching, I'm out.